Okay, okay. I think uh, we are ready to kick it off. So I think you guys have, most of you have found the comment or the chat section. You have a little um, bar at the bottom of the screen and that should, there should be a chat function there so you can chat with us. So we'll say um, questions and so on. Please use the chat function for that. And then we'll, uh, <laughs> Nuno just corrected it. Hello, Dr. And Michael. Yes. <laughs> so we're, um, so just ask questions in the chat and then we'll, uh, we'll go through all the questions or if there are any questions, we'll go through them at the end of the webinar. Uh, that is, is what usually works best. Uh, it sounds like the sound and image is good here. Um, we will have two potentially awkward transitions because uh, Brian is in Toronto and I'm in Vancouver. So we're at opposite um, uh, sides of the country. So we'll have just two transitions where uh, we have to sh uh, you know, pass over control of the screen. It should be smooth. I'm just warning you, disclaimer, if that should give a little bit of awkwardness. Awesome. Um, so we're kicking off this uh, webinar. Uh, it's one we're pretty excited about. Um, I'm, I'm certainly very excited about it because uh, understanding the role of psychology and neuroscience and conversion optimization is something that is kind of new to me. It's something, well, new and new. It's within the last four years, I've started working with it. I've uh, had the pleasure of uh, working with a bunch of different people who've taught me a lot. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I'm now working with Brian Kugelman because uh, Brian is such a legit uh, scientist and I'm not. <laughs> Uh, on the other hand, I do have quite a lot of um, hands-on experience from having done zero for 10 years. So, Brian, if you could just uh, switch the slide real quick. Great. So, that's kind of how Brian and I uh, complement each other. So, Brian has such a founding in, in the science and he, he's a PhD and he spent so many years really digging into this stuff, working with top neuroscientists and so on. I've spent my time doing hands-on zero work. And the interesting thing is when Brian and I met each other, we actually had a lot of the same experiences and conclusions and so on, just from two very different angles. So mine was, oh, there's a question here. Is there going to be a recording? Yes, there's going to be a recording afterwards. Um, but um, uh, so that's how we complement each other. And the interesting thing was when we met and we started talking, it was we, we had a lot of the same conclusions. Brian had a different way of explaining it. We use different terminology, and the thing that was really interesting for me was how aligned everything really was. Just what I've found out through practical experience, and what Brian has found out through science. The the thing that was mind blowing to me was all of a sudden Brian had explanations. I was saying, "Oh, it seems like when I do this, this happens," or "It seems like people react like this when I do that," and when I run a split test like this, the, you know, the outcome is this. And then the the really really fascinating thing for me was that Brian could explain to me. Uh, why those things are happening, the psychological uh, background for it. And he could also help me understand what's going on in people's brains. And so when we're talking about the role of psychology and neuroscience in, in, in conversion optimization, to me, I finally understand that. For a long time, I didn't understand it. It, it, it was pop psychology, what I knew, and it was pretty gimmicky, a lot of it. And it's very prescription-oriented. That like oh do these three things then that will always work to me it's much more complex than that and what I think um, the fascinating part about psychology and neuroscience is it has helped me basically have more empathy for the users out there so we're doing all this digitally there's a lot of you know spreadsheets and stuff like that but really it's 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 human beings on the other side of the screen who make all this stuff happen so to me it's logical that the better we understand them the better we understand them, um, the better we, we can do our work and, and the better we'll be at doing zero simply. And also it helps us understand, um, it, it just simply helps us understand people's behavior better, especially when it's illogical. So I think back in, back in the day before I started understanding this stuff, I'd just get angry and be like, ah, these people are stupid. And I think a lot of um, business owners, website owners, habitants, things like that. But once you start getting into psychology and neuroscience, you start understanding the psychological and uh, brain chemical <laughs> explanation as to why this happens. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, wow, actually, I'm the one who messed up here. It's actually because of the website experience I am providing them with that they can't figure it out. Okay, I kind of went all over the place with that intro. Let's go to the next step. Uh, we have one more presenter, uh, actually, we'd like to uh, introduce here, and this is uh, Douglas the Squirrel, a.k.a. your customer. And he plays a central uh, role in this uh, presentation. We'd like to just show, 
show you a real quick video with Douglas here. If you uh, just switch the slide. So this is a little video I recorded uh, the other day. I was uh, out in the woods and I was trying to get this little guy to eat a, a, a seed from my hand. So uh, we'll put this into context a little bit later why this video is, is central to this presentation. But as you'll see here, the squirrel here is deliberating and trying to figure out whether it's safe to, to grab the little seed from my hand. There's a big scary human there, but on the other hand, there's also a reward, something that would be really good for his survival. Uh, he ends up electing not to take it, so he found out that there was too much risk involved. We'll get back to that later. If you should change the slide, Brad. All right, so let's kick it off and I'll just uh, hand it over to Brian from here. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, thanks for the introduction. That was wonderful. And I also have to say it's been a delight working with uh, Michael on, on the content that we're going through and also um, uh, a collaboration that we've been working on where we've been bringing together a fusion between Front, Michael's many years of frontline CRO with uh, many of my years working in behavioral sciences and different areas. Uh, uh, what's been wonderful working with Michael is making these connections between a lot of theory and the frameworks which give us generalizable broad understanding and then also connecting that up to real world application. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to just give you a very quick introduction and talk about what does it actually mean to apply psychology and in interactive media. And then we're going to look at, well, how do, how do we apply it? Because the translation from theory and science and neuroscience into practice is one that has to be bridged. And many people are uncomfortable and they don't understand it. But it's actually, it's a wonderful place. And for me, it's the, the funnest place because it's where um, a lot of insight and research turns into a free-flowing creative process. So let's start by talking about how we can even describe what's going on on a page. For example, if I look at any web page, depending on my background, I can bring different things to it. Like here at the bottom, we have industry lingo. So, you know, I think for a lot of us who work in conversion optimization, who mainly worked in industry, um, we come to start using terms that are popular in the industry. So we'll talk about value propositions or, you know, maybe have a debate like, should you put your benefits before the features or should the features go before the benefits? the common one and if people don't trust us you might say well you know the problem is you just don't have enough trust like so get on some certificates and some social norms or something like that and so these are more uh, industry terms but if you're studying psychology you'll describe what's going on in different ways so you might talk about an incentive as um, using mechanisms for the anticipation of reward that people feel or we might talk about boosting confidence or self-efficacy, which are literally the same terms, it's just different jargon. So uh, these are psychological constructs you could use. But uh, nowadays, neurosciences begin to get a lot more traction in the behavioral sciences. And there we look at very specific mechanisms on how motivational structures work. So instead of talking about anticipating reward or a value prop, we might say triggering the reward system. Or for loss aversion techniques, uh, we talk about like fight or flight reactions. So we can use different concepts to describe what's going on. And as long as everyone you're working with understands, you can communicate with them. People come from different backgrounds. It can get a little tough because people have different ways of describing it. So I'm just going to do one more slide next and go into a bit more detail to give you some context on what these concepts mean and i'm just going to go quickly because we only have uh we have less than an hour for this whole presentation so we we're just going to go into a couple areas but let's start with the bigger picture so here are three totally different perspectives you can take to describing uh psychological strategies that apply to the web and behavioral science so let's start off with the behavioral sciences so um, there are different definitions, but if we look at a really radical version of behavioral science, what behavioral scientists do is they take a very practical approach to behavior change, and it's a lot like split testing. So they say, you know, there's all these psychological theories, and 
maybe they're true, maybe they're not. Uh, we don't really know why people change their behavior. So we're going to change the brain like a black box. And we'll say, we know if we use this behavior change technique that it produces an outcome. And we know it from just measuring in different randomized control trials and scientific studies. And what the behavioral scientists are a bit more radical will say is just, all you have to do is measure input and output. And then you know what works and you know what doesn't work. So it's very practical. Uh, the psychological perspective is a little different. So in the psychological perspective, you'll say there's different theories and it's a bit like a gray box. So we have theories, say one around self-efficacy or self-confidence that says one of the main factors in a person changing their behavior is the confidence that they can change. And, and that's the concept that we have. So we have a bit of a gray box because we're not fully looking into the brain, but we have these concepts that we use to describe it. And when they're good concepts, we can generalize to multiple applications. And we can use these rules to have a good sense of what's most likely going to work in many situations. And what, what these theories do is they help you know in new situations that you haven't been in before, what will probably be a, a good set of principles to build on. I know neuroscience is completely different. So neuroscience is, well, actually, let's chop open the brain using imaging techniques and look inside. And from that, we can get a sense of the internal mechanisms that are at play when different behavior change techniques are being used. And so there's an area of behavioral neuroscience that tries to make these links between like uh, <laughs> uh, phenomena at a micro uh, level and connect up with broader behavior. Now, the problem with neuroscience is that it gets so detailed, it can sometimes be hard to connect it up with what's going on on the outside. So we're going to constantly jump around and borrow different perspectives. Um, and what we're going to do just in the next, uh, you know, remainder of this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about cognitive psychology, and we're going to talk about um, emotions and uh, neuroscience. That is most of the heavy theory stuff. So I'm going to start on cognitive and then I'm going to hand over to Michael. Let me start with just a simple concept and we're going to build upon this in all like the following slides. And what this is, is it's um, one of the mo popular models used to describe what's happening with memory system. So with a memory system, you have some sort of sensory input, say someone's looking at a website. And then they had their sensory memory. So this is where people remember what they saw, they, what they heard. And after, you know, 0.3 to 10 seconds, we forget what we saw. So things go in, they're stored in memory, we have a visual memory, and then we lose what we're not paying attention to. Now, when we're focused on something, it goes into working memory. Working memory is a little bit like our consciousness. So that's where we can hold information uh, for about 10 to 20 seconds. And after we don't pay attention to things, we lose them. So our senses are constantly getting overloaded. And so, you know, you might've heard the convention that you remember seven plus or minus two items. You know, that's a dated statistic. So now the convention is that you remember four plus or minus one, which basically means people will remember three to five items. And if more than that, chances are you're overloading people. And so Michael's gonna talk a lot about um, cognitive psychology and a lot of these strategies build on not overloading this short-term memory. Now, ultimately, short-term memory is the path to long-term memory and we need to get into our users' long-term memory. So if we want them to remember our value propositions, if they have good emotional associations with us, we want those to be encoded in their long-term memory. So next time they see us, um, their emotions fire, and they're good emotions, as opposed to bad emotions when we have bad backfire. And so long-term memory is the ultimate goal for a lot of what we're doing. So we're, when we focus on cognitive and emotional, next, uh, a lot of Michael's techniques will tie in with uh, the short-term memory system, and then when I go into emotions, a lot of them have impact for long-term memory. So. Um, but first, we are going to talk about glucose. Now, um, glucose and consciousness have a correlation. It's um, a messy one, and it's one that was hit by the replication studies recently. 
but there's still some good lessons. And so we're going through an area of science that did have an unhinging, um, and there are still a lot of good lessons, but we do have to treat some of these with a bit of caution. And I'll, I'll warn you where you need to take caution. So let me talk about uh, glucose level. So during the day, if, you, if you're not on a paleo diet or low protein, and I, I am a fan of my <laughs> uh, coffee with uh, butter and MCT oil. So I, I, I watch my diet. I don't, like, I don't like my blood sugar levels to look like this, but this is what most people's blood sugar levels look like. So they have food in the morning, the blood sugar levels spike, they drop down, and before lunch, people have lower glucose levels. After lunch, they go up and down. Um, um, people with diabetes have extreme fluctuations in their glucose levels. And when their glucose levels start getting low, they'll start uh, experiencing very specific symptoms, feeling you know a little unfocused and groggy, uh, and then having a, like a hard time concentrating. And ultimately, if you don't manage your glucose levels at healthy levels, you will soon um, start going losing your ability to focus, to concentrate, it'll be hard for you to speak, and eventually you will go unconscious and you will die from low glucose levels. So, so the brain manages, or sorry, our body manages our glucose levels and our brain needs a certain level to function. Now, um, there are associations between glucose levels and concentration. Um, they're contradictory theories and we can use it as insight into things that drain our users. And so, um, you should never go to court at about 11 o'clock. There are studies from Israel that show going to court at 11 o'clock will probably not turn out in your favor because judges have very bad judgment at this point. And so um, this comes from a paper that uh, is considered controversial because there's contradictory results, but it gives us some clues into what's going on. And so um, there are associations with Glucose and people's concentration, willpower, persistence to complete tasks, be their completion and their helpfulness towards other people. And so uh, brain glucose levels, when they're getting low, potentially are associated with people who are not willing to complete tasks as, as fast. So we need to be always careful uh, about this. And one of the underpinning theories is that when we do any task online or in any, any context, we make this intuitive cost-benefit analysis where we say, is this worth the effort? And one of the uh, theories on the association of glucose is that this might be one of the mechanisms that explain why glucose is there. Possibly when our brain is full, we're not as uh, worried about our resources as at other times. And this cost-benefit analysis is also theorized to be the basis under which uh, the entire field of behavioral economics um, sits. Um, it's one of the theories about why we even have uh, cognitive biases. So why we go into a situation, we say, you know what, this is not so important to me. So I'm just going to go on this little rule of thumb and not really think about it. And that's the case where people are swayed by superficial uh, design factors, by what looks to be credible by, you know, testimonial techniques, things like that. And, and one of the arguments is that without this, um, it's harder to use these techniques. Um, and generally, as a, as a ballpark rule of thumb, I find that these principles work a literal, like, the cognitive biases, are, they work more in your favor in sort of lower risk situations, but extremely high risk situations, uh, people are a lot more likely to kick the tires and other factors are not as important. So, at this point, it's time for me to hand over. Yep. All righty. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian. So I'm going to show you uh, just some practical examples here uh, of what Brian has been talking about here. So there's a classic uh, experiment called the Stroop test, which illustrates very well kind of like the connection between cognitive load um, and 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 uh, multitasking and how uh, quickly our brains can become uh, overloaded. We're also going to look a little bit more at glucose here. But the Stroop test basically is this very simple one where there's two steps in the test. So the first step here really is you have a test subject, and then all they really have to do is read out 
the words here. So you'll see that the, the font color uh, and the word here is the same. And then there's a, a next step in the uh, that makes this a little bit more difficult. Look at the, just how my test subject here does in, in this many times or this uh, experiment. And uh, I'm using my colleague uh, uh, my, or my former colleague and good friend Stephanie Greaser from Unbounce. And this has nothing to do with intelligence, by the way. Steph is super smart. And this, what we see here basically happen, has happened every single time I've run this experiment. Um, I don't believe you'll be able to hear the sound on this one, but that's not really important. So as you see, that was a very, very easy exercise. It took Steph uh, seven seconds to go through it. There was absolutely no friction at all, no hesitation, bam, 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 went right through. So the next step here, we're gonna co the, the color described by the word uh, is different than the font color. So now the way we're gonna make it a little bit more difficult is the answer is different here. Well, now what Steph has to do, she has to tell me the font color. So for example, with the first one here, it would be wrong to say green, red would be the right answer. So really now we're, we're asking her to multitask a little bit. So let's see how she does in this one. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you could hear the sound, but the cool thing is Steph in the last clip, she says it takes a little bit longer, but you get the hang of it. A little bit longer, it took over three times as long. So again, this has nothing to do with intelligence. This, uh, I've, I've, I've run this experiment with a lot of people and the same thing happens every single time. So the, <clears throat> the, the intuitive reaction of the brain is just to, to read the word that it sees. So it's actually pretty heavy multitasking when you have to try to override that impulse and actually go, no, 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 that's not the right answer. I can't say green, I have to say red. And it's just a very, very uh, simple way of illustrating how quickly we can overload the brains. And, and for the human brain, multitasking is one of the most uh, difficult things we can do. Keeping track of several things uh, at once is just very, very heavy for us. But also what this uh, experiment here illustrates is basically the difference between <clears throat> you could say kind of autopilot, automa uh, automatic thinking, and very deliberate analytical thinking, which brings us to this point here. Um, Daniel Kahneman, brilliant um, behavioral psychologist, uh, he wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I recommend. He talks about two different modes of thinking. So this is, is not a physical, like physically two different areas of the brain he's talking about here, just talking about two very different ways of thinking, intuitive thinking and analytical thinking. That's kind of what we saw illustrated here. In the first example, it's just intuitive thinking. The brain just does its thing. In the second one, there's analytical thinking. You have to override um, your impulses uh, to actually do it. So uh, Kahneman uh, calls these two or actually, sorry, there's one step here. Uh, a way of describing the difference here is that Intuitive thinking is something that just happens to you. It's autopilot and uh, analytical thinking is something you do. It takes conscious effort. And Kahneman calls these two systems or these two different characters, uh, system one and system two. Uh, and you can't really, this is a little bit of an oversimplification. He says that too when you read his book, but this is just too, he kind of turns them into characters so it's easy to understand. But this is, a, I, in my experience, a very, very good and helpful way of thinking about it. So we have system one and system two, and the nickname for system one is a machine for jumping to conclusions, and system two is the lazy controller. And like we saw in the example here with, uh, with Steph also, you know, system one likes to jump to conclusions. So system one is very, very quick to just read the word rather than actually go um, for the color. Um, and so one of the things, one of the effects of analytical uh, thinking is that it, it just demands more resources on the brain, from the brain. And as, as Ryan said recently some of these glue close uh, experiments have kind of um, turned out that they were a bit oversimplified, so it's more difficult than just. But there is a connection there, we know, and it, it looks like a good explanation is the cost benefit analysis. So, really, 
the lower you get on glucose, the more you're, you're going to, your brain is automatically going to have a little bit of a cost benefit analysis going on saying, do we really need to spend energy on this? Are we, are this worth my effort? And so like Brian mentioned before, that also makes it easier to trigger some uh, cognitive biases because once your blood sugar is really, really low, yeah, this is basically what you feel like. I don't know if you've ever, one example I use often is trying to book tickets through, uh, through Ryanair. If you live in Europe and you've ever done that, you know, that's an absolute horrible, insane nightmare <laughs> trying to go through it. And everything is just crazy. And they have so many dark patterns and upsells and by, you know, when you spend about 15 minutes trying to book tickets and then you're just, you're just ready to sleep for eight hours or drink eight liters of Coca-Cola just to get some more glucose to your brain. Um, so it can get really, really, really heavy. And something like this, for example, this example I've used quite a lot, but when you come into a page like a landing page like this and you're immediately hit with so many different options here, that's a very, very good way of overloading the brain right away. Brian talked about before three to five things is basically what we can kind of manage to keep track of at once. So stuff like this is just an immediate, uh, <laughs> an immediate um, uh, maxing out of our cognitive abilities. But this one gets worse because if you, accidentally graze the mega drop down you get hit with you know even more of these so basically it's you know 107 links at once here i'm looking for one basically i'd say the optimal uh, the optimal balance here would be one link so i think when you see an example like this it also becomes pretty clear that it's it's overwhelming and when you start an experience off like this um you're basically maxing out the cognitive load right away so now we so we mentioned cognitive biases you can call these mental shortcuts and these are so the brain really tries to conserve as much energy as possible uh, because it's it's a big massive muscle we have and it, it, it demands so much energy from us to use our brain so uh, the, the brain tries to <clears throat> save precious cognitive <clears throat> sorry energy and uh, one of the ways it does that is by creating some mental shortcuts so basically if we go back to kind of system one and system two uh, we spend most of our time in, in system one, it's always on. And then once in a while, system two, the lazy controller uh, takes over. But again, that's depending on, on how low you are on your resources, uh, it can be more difficult to kick in uh, system two. So therefore, we have some of these mental shortcuts and we're even more prone to them when uh, we're, we're, we're low on our resources. So we're going to just go through one here, which is pretty central and, uh, and an important uh, uh, bias, which is priming. This basically revolves around the theory that exposure to one stimulus influences response to a subsequent stimulus. I'm going to show you an experiment here. I, I recreated It's a classic experiment. Um, uh, Daniel Kahneman uses it uh, in his book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow as well. But I wanted to recreate it and also make it a little bit more <clears throat> uh, challenging than his. But basically, it revolves around uh, filling out uh, the, the, the missing letter in this word here so it becomes uh, an actual word. So basically, you could write soap or soup in English. So in this experiment, when people were exposed to the word wash first, they filled out, you know, put in the A so it became soap. And if they were exposed to the word eat before, they would write soup. So basically priming being once you say eat, your thoughts go over to soup. And if you say uh, wash, your, your thoughts go to soap. So I thought I'd try and recre recreate this uh, experiment. So I did, a, uh, I did uh, a series of usability tests. I had 100 uh, users in each sample. And um, for this one, we needed like a baseline experiment with no priming. So we have an idea of kind of what people would do if we don't prime. So I asked them to fill out this word, and 92% uh, wrote uh, soap, 8% wrote soup. So for the rest of these experiments I was doing here, I was thinking, okay, now I have to see if I can you know, prime people to write soup instead of soap. So here we have the baseline experiment. Uh, so for experiment two, I exposed them to this icon first, and then I asked them to fill out the word. And then 68% wrote uh, soup. And so an increase from a relative, the relative increase from 8% to 68 is massive. Of several hundred percent, that's a, that's a huge <laughs> difference right there. Uh, for the next experiment, I said, uh, imagine you're hungry and want to eat. And then I asked them to fill out the word. And then we had 76% saying soup. And for the final experiment, I showed them an icon with, an icon with 
what could be interpreted as a bowl of soup. And then we're up to 84% uh, writing soup. So obviously this is a fun little experiment and this is, you know, when you do stuff like this, we have quite a good sample here and it's, it's an illustrative example. It doesn't obviously mean that it's always this easy to prime people, but it does illustrate the fact that it's, it doesn't necessarily take that much effort to finally uh, prime people and to actually change their expectations. So if we translate that to the online world, we'll say, for example, a good, or a good example of priming would be the connection between an ad and a landing page. So I just came across this one yesterday. It's a very, very clear uh, value proposition here. Uh, the font size also indicates it's the most important thing, $35 off any plumbing repair. So that is, is firmly printed in my brain now along with the imagery. So when we go to the landing page, see the images, imagery is there, the, uh, the colors match and so on, and, and the logo and the dude and everything. There's one thing missing though, and it's not anywhere on the page, and that's the $35 off. That's the main thing you're promising me. That's gonna be what motivates me to click, but it's not there, I can't find it. You've primed me to look for one thing, but it isn't there, and that is, can cause some friction, can cause a problem, because now my brain has to recalibrate, and I actually have to go looking for, basically, the missing value proposition. Where's that 30? Five bucks. I was expecting a CTA that says, <laughs> "Click here to get thirty-five dollars off, and you know, and book your plumbing service." <clears throat> but another thing here, if we talk about cognitive load and we talk about system one and two stuff, uh, is basically, well, what we'd like to do is we'd like to keep people in a steady flow where they don't really consider too much. We like to keep them in system one, where it's just intuitive, and they go through. Once we kick in system two and people have to start doing analytical thinking, well, then first and foremost, they become more aware. They become hyper aware of little things. And secondly, that's when we start uh, maxing out the cognitive load and making the experience just much more difficult for them. So another thing here is the headline says select a, a, a plumbing service. All right, cool. How do I do that? Well, the, the dots here indicate all the different things you can choose. So for me to select a plumbing service now, first and foremost, you pride me with the, you know, save 35 bucks. That was nowhere to be seen. Then you're telling me to select a plumbing service and you give me what to me is an overwhelming amount of plumbing services here. There's details for each one. You can see more. And then uh, at the bottom of the page, uh, I'm, not, I'm just going to move. I'm not sure if this, uh, my little um, panel here is interfering. So I'll just, if it was, I'll just move it here. And then at the bottom of the page, it basically says, can't find the service you need? If, these, if it wasn't there among these 17, well, then just contact us. The funny thing is that uh, if you go in and, and read more about these um, different services, you can't really book them. You go to the same link that you, or the same page that you would if you just click contact us. So, so they might as well just have to contact us, CTA. It's just horribly confusing. And then going from what could be a very simple experience of saying, yes, I want 35 bucks off, become a lead, and then maybe a drop down where you say, this is the general thing I'm interested in, just really making it a lot more complicated for me going through this. So this is kind of a typical example of how, how quickly you can, you can put out little kind of psychological traps that will just make the experience much harder for the user. And so this is what I mean by something that was fundamentally eye-opening for me is when I started understanding these little connections here, I could also just understand the whole user experience much better and how to build better experiences. So another important point here with priming is that when you're going through, for example, optimizing a funnel, it could be something like that, like this, where you know, someone performs a search, then they see a PPC ad, then they go to a landing page, from the landing page they go to a form page, and then they have to fill out the form, and then they're through to the confirmation. So basically, in every step of, of this little funnel here, there's potential for, you know, maxing out the cognitive load or making people have you know, feel bad emotions and, and so on, uh, confusing them and all this stuff. So really, every single step in the funnel primes the next, and it's very important then that you are very clear about what you're promising on step one, for example, and that you then deliver on that promise on step two, and that you're clear and transparent about what's going to happen. I call this managing expectations, which is really, really important. So you're kind of on the same page with your users and you're not um, you know, making them upset or whatever. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Brian. Great, hey, thanks a lot. Um, actually, a question uh, came in from uh, Fernando. Hello? Um, 
And the first one is pretty straightforward. So um, is the cognitive load lower if you use And the answer is yes. Um, so after a person has like acquired habitual behavior, they don't have to think consciously about doing it. Um, yeah, the action becomes automatic. And so we're not dealing with consciousness at that point. We're dealing with like unconscious trained behavior. So absolutely. Um, and then there's a second question is, <clears throat> Um, if uh, the cognitive load is lower, uh, will that benefit a user's short-term memory? And of course, the answer to that is also yes. So <clears throat> if the cognitive load is lower, then um, that means it's easier for the person to process information. Um, if we go beyond that person's memory, working memory limits, uh, we start overloading. And so think about doing a complex math problem. So if I ask you, what's 10 minus 5? times 12 plus 13. Well, now, uh, many of us can actually do that, but the way we do that is we hold things in memory. So like, what was that first thing? And you're holding on to it. And now you're trying to process, but you, you're repeating at the same time and holding on. And at some point, um, none of us can hold on to something because we've absolutely overloaded the system. But we could all, all probably do what, you know, 10 plus five minus three. Right, so, so that one we can hold on. And so the short-term memory helps. Um, oh, sorry, the uh, lower the cognitive load, the easier it is for people to process. And it's literally as simple as that. Uh, now, uh, let me now uh, move over. And I am going to oh, continue. Yeah, you just have to take over the screen sharing. One, one moment. Okay, great. So uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about neuroscience. Um, I'm going to go into a discussion about emotions, and then Michael's going to show you a couple more examples after. Um, actually, or did you want to start off by talking about our squirrel? Okay, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, Brian is going to explain this in much more detail, but basically the reason why we showed the squirrel here is because the squirrel is a mammal too, like we are. And uh, the, the, what's going on with the, in, inside the squirrel's brain here is, is very similar to what's happening with the customer. So again, this is, has nothing to do with intelligence. We're not suggesting that your customers have the intelligence of a squirrel at all. I just want to put that disclaimer out there. But what we are claiming is that um, it's basically the same uh, deliberation is going through, if you could call it that, on an unconscious level. So we could compare the the beam here uh, to the funnel and we can say that the the seed we got here is is basically the landing page of the offer and then the squirrel uh, is the user and so there's the squirrel is, is feeling emotions here and Brian is going to talk more about that but there's some chemicals in his brain that's causing it to have some emotional reactions here and it's basically uh, a survival task here. The squirrel can see that there is uh, something tasty, some food that's good for its survival right in front of it, and that is, so that is propelling it towards that. But at the same time, there's a big scary human, a threat there holding it. So there's also part of the squirrel which is very aware that this might potentially be bad for its survival, and it's basically struggling between those two. Uh, the, the potential of getting something good and the potential of basically a punishment, carrot or stick. And this is very, very similar to the way that uh, your users will uh, uh, go through your funnel and approach your offer. All right, Brian. All right. So let's now talk about motivation of squirrels and users. So, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that neuroscience has to offer um, far beyond psychology is a much more precise understanding of how emotions work and exactly what they are. And so when we look at emotion from a neuroscientific perspective, it's almost, it literally is synonymous with the word motivation. And at this point, I, I struggle to tell the difference between the word motivation and emotion. Motivation and emotion, they're literally the same thing. And so an emotion is what happens when our body reacts to any sort of threat or opportunity. Um, our brain is getting us ready to take an action. And so, there are a number of motivators that we can look at. And 
What I have in front of you is an updated version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but this was put together by a scholar, Kendrick, and a team that said, well, let's actually take a look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It had, it's, you know, most behavioral scientists actually don't use Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, no one I know in health really uses it at all. Like, and and there's, there's actually far superior health behavior change research uh, possibly than uh, any other area of the behavioral sciences. I, like, I literally don't know an area of science that has more insight on how to change behavior than, than health. And so we can take a lot from there and learn from it. But uh, one thing is they don't go near Maslow. And literally the only people who use Maslow are, I think it's still in like undergraduate business textbooks on motivation. But, and marketers. <laughs> yeah, and, and marketers. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so uh, if you're using Maslow, uh, uh, let me show you something different. And I think it's a more legitimate upgrade. Um, so Maslow did put together the, with the first concept of a hierarchy by looking at the research on what motivates people. He threw it into a very simple framework. And it was a pretty popular one, but he reneged on the concept of self-actualization. Many people don't like that because it had like a humanist um, spiritual dimension to it. And without that, it's just cold-hearted survival of the fittest type of model. Uh, but a few years ago, some neuroscientists um, and evolutionary psychologists said, well, let's actually look at Maslow's hierarchy because there's some interesting parallels to what we know about the actual motivational systems, not just of humans, but of mammals in general. And so what I'm going through is a very broad motivational model that applies to mammals and many living things. And uh, let me walk you through them. Now, I'm going to walk up conceptually, and I'm going to talk very quickly about the neurochemicals that give us a certain insight, and then I'm just going to touch on a couple of them. So at the bottom, we have physiological survival. So physiological, uh, oh, sorry, our homeostasis. So this is our body's balance, and we need to maintain this. And when we're not in a homeostasis, we're out of balance. It means something's wrong with us physically. And so we are probably going to be dealing with survival issues. So when our body is not in this um, ideal, like healthy or uh, basic uh, resting state, um, something's wrong and we're motivated to solve the problem there. We feel the effect, we feel the hunger, we feel we have to go to the washroom, we feel uh, we have something that we're feeling like some pain, some problem, and we're motivated. And this captures your attention and you deal with it. Next is safety and security. When we're hit with uh, imminent threat, so there's something dangerous. If you do not act, you're in trouble. So if you don't get out of the way, you will get hit by that car. If you don't seize this opportunity, you're going to lose it. You have to act. So these are generally stress-inducing motivators relationships and community. So this is where we talk about our social bonds and our relationships with other people. And on the flip side is the threat of losing contact with people we care about or being rejected by groups. Next up, status and esteem. We are very hierarchical species. Not as hierarchical as other primates, uh, but we have strong hierarchies. And feelings of pride and feeling honored and having received respect feels good. It's an emotional reward. Um, the flip side is an emotional punishment, feeling demeaned, degraded, insulted, disempowered, uh, unable to control uh, your situation. So status and control and power relationships go all hand in hand. Next up, sex. Sex is a motivator. Sex is not in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You cannot have a model of human motivation or motivation for literally almost every living thing on the planet without sex. So we, we're very motivated to reproduce. Uh, the motivational structures here are all distinct. So love motivational structures are distinct from the motivational structures in the brain for sex. So uh, we're, we're motivated for, for love, for intimate pair bonding relationships. And parenting is a fairly strong motivator. Again, the population would not survive without it. And after someone has children, they're radically different. So uh, the neuroscientists argue that people don't mature because they have kids, but 
during the process of parenting, people, people are completely rewired neurologically. So you actually are a different person pre and post children. Uh, so what I started doing about five years ago, I started working on my own and then I was collaborating with a neuroscientist. Is we mapped out the neurochemical correlation. And so at the bottom, uh, with homeostasis, when the body is not in perfect balance, there are a number of mechanisms. Uh, one of them, when there's an imminent threat, is the stress. We talk about cortisol. Um, cortisol is more acute when we talk about safety and security. So cortisol triggers when there's an imminent threat and wakes us up and says, deal with this right now. And if you don't, you're screwed. Like, uh, you're, you're in trouble when you don't deal with certain situations. And when we talk about marketing applications, this is where we talk about grudge purchases, loss aversion tactics. Next up, relationships and community. We can talk about oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter associated with social cognition, social bonds, connections with people. And it also has correlations with emotional pain and feelings of rejection. Next up, status, uh, self-esteem. There are correlations to serotonin, possibly more on the mood side, and in controlling the behavioral and um, uh, cognitive uh, traits that lead to people having higher status. So when people feel more confident and controlled, there are correlations with serotonin. Um, there are also correlations to status tied with low levels of um, cortisol and higher levels of testosterone, but I think they're more tied to the behavior that lead to having status. So, more relaxed and a bit more competitive in nature. Now, on the, on the flip side are very awful emotions of feeling helpless, hopeless, disempowered, and like useless and, and use. And when you go far enough down this line, we get into suicidal behavior and, and no will to live. So these are really, I'm very cautious about playing with uh, hierarchical emotional systems in design. I treat them with extreme caution. Um, Sex, obviously, sex sells and marketing. There's a lot to say about using this. Uh, the, we're, we're getting into a cocktail. Testosterone is also a key driver of sex, not just men, but also women. Love is considered a cocktail where we have a lot of dopamine, um, oxytocin, um, and, and high, high levels of um, uh, energy that are released during the process. And in parenting, um, I haven't researched uh, this as much, but there's also there's a cocktail of neural. No. What I do with the model is I break incentives and loss aversion techniques into the two sides. So when we want to motivate people, what we do is we promise that we're going to give you one of these, which is a positive thing. This is a motive. We're going to give you one of these, which is a good thing. Now, a value proposition is a promise that you give someone something they care about. Now, the other way you motivate people is with loss aversion. And loss aversion is the equal motivator. But that's what it's a value prop that says, if you do what we recommend, or you buy this product we have, or you join this program, you're going to avoid this bad situation, and that's a good thing. So, so these are the two ways we motivate. Now, I did talk about dopamine for all, but overall, dopamine is released on um, anticipation of reward. So if I flip back, anytime we're promising to help someone achieve one of these, we're we're potentially, if we do it well, triggering dopamine, where people say, you know what, I, this, this is interesting. interesting to me. You know, this is something that I want. So um, anything that someone cares about will make them interested. And so dopamine um, is a trigger that says, there's a reward here we can get. I'm interested. I want to learn more. And then once you, once you have even just a small amount, people will pay attention. And of course, with those loss aversion techniques, we have cortisol. It says, um, there's a potential threat here, and that's going to wake you up. So this anticipation of reward and um, avoidance of threats are the two major ways that we wake people up. So Now, we can go a step further and break this up into a whole range of emotions. Now, I'm only going to touch the surface because we don't have a lot of time here. But when we promise that we're going to give someone something good, that's a motivator. And that's where we talk about incentives. So this is where we fire people up with it excitement, anticipation of reward. And I talked about the negative side there. So these are things where if, if you remove a bad thing, then that's a motivator. And that's what we call loss aversion. So 
quite often we're using both of these techniques at once. Um, some people call that um, carrot and stick. Uh, carrot and stick is a bit confusing because it actually has two separate meanings, but, but some people use carrot and stick in this way on the motivational side of the equation. Um, and this is where we, we do talk about pressure tactics. Now, the two things in here in red are not necessarily bad. They're just things that stop behavior. And one is when someone's loyal. So if you get someone to the point where they're a loyal customer, they'll feel that if I, I'm going to remove a good thing. So if someone's really satisfied with what you're doing, um, they're going to actually not, they'll be in a retention relationship with, with you, which is wonderful. But it's hard to upsell them to other things because they fear if I, I can, if I remove, do something, I'll remove that good thing I have. And this is the worst area you could ever be in in pessimism, where people feel that no matter what they do, they're going to get a bad thing. So if you're with a crappy company and you feel trapped in helplessness, um, that's where you'll be. And we never, ever want our users in here, but we want to find our competitors, customers who are in here, and poach them. Right for defection. They're, when they're truly here, they, they feel helpless and frustrated. Let me show you something. Here's Flo. Not everyone is from America. Um, Flo is the figurehead of an insurance company. And she's looking nice and smiley here, but this is, this is the art of war here. Flo's actually really, <laughs> she, she's taking from Sun Tzu's uh, handbook here. So <laughs> when you switch to progressive, you could save this much money. So this is saying, you know what? You have a crappy deal. And by the way, you don't, you don't know how bad it is, but we're just letting you know that you're sort of being ripped off. And, <laughs> and, so you're actually trapped in a crappy company. So they're dissatisfying the competitors. So this is a total poach the competitors. Ad. Now, here's a totally different strategy. This is going from stress to content. So it's saying, this is a loss aversion. It could also be combined with an optimistic ad, but this is more of saying, look, uh, we're going to make you not have to worry. You're going to be content. So this is more a, a, a play for trying to get people to be content. Now, let me talk about backfires because the thing with applying psychology is most people who pitch it, um, who haven't been around the block for a while, they don't really know how bad things can get when you misapply psychology. And the reality is that if Every, like everyone who works in evaluating behavior change programs and everyone who works in the science who goes to conferences knows about these because they come up all the time. Now, they're not always talked about, but normally you go out to bars with your professional colleagues and, and pretty, you know, after a few beers, people are talking about crazy backfires and everyone's laughing because they're so ridiculous sometimes. But they're widely known, but no one talks about them. And the reason why is because it's a stigma, it's an embarrassment to your program if you're working in behavior change, it's an embarrassment to your scientific study, and if you're in a company, this stuff is a shame to your corporation. So, so there's a big stigma. Um, so uh, I put together a simple model with a friend of mine, Dr. Stibe, on the types of outcomes. And I'll just put it into perspective, and very quickly we have to get to uh, some examples. So, we mainly talk about our intended outcome. So what we want to achieve, and we often have unintended outcomes. If you can't do any marketing communications or design without having activists. It's, it's just not gonna happen. You'll always have things that work out you plan for, but things that are accidental. And we have positive outcomes and negative outcomes. Normally, we, we aim for the positive, but sometimes we get the negative. We, we can't control everything, but you know, the more we work, the more we optimize, the, the more we uh, fewer loss. Up here in the upper right, we have target main goal. So maybe we want people to click on our call to action. Um, but say we're running a campaign, we get a lot of people, they, you know, they come to our landing page. Not everyone's clicking. We haven't increased our click-through rate. But somehow we actually built a lot of brand awareness. And so we accidentally climbed our population uh, to be a bit more trusting towards us. So we say, okay, we didn't exactly get what we want, but at least there, there's uh, something good that has come out of it. So that's an unexpected benefit. Up in the, here, the upper left, when we talk about the, the win-win situation, 
that we often look for. If we have a situation where, you know, not really a win-win, we win, but the audience doesn't win, um, and that's intended, that's what we call dark pattern. That's blatant manipulation. Uh, any good uh, marketing and outreach will be win-win. If we're not offering products that our, our customers care about, that's not a win. So a value proposition that motivates that, sorry, I got to swear here, but that is bullshit because we're not actually delivering on our promises. That, that's a form of manipulation. Pattern just as much as any tricky, sly a design tech we can use. So, so we want to build a win-win. Dark patterns, they're wonderful short-term strategies, but you, you, can't, you can't have long-term conversions because you have to get out of town and now you're going to have to throw your money into managing all the angry people on social media. So um, we scan for these. We never want to go near them and we never want anyone to think we're doing them. And we're not going to go now into it, but there's a lot we can do to avoid, avoid that. Now, this can happen all the time. It's when there's a bad outcome for our audience um, and possibly for us. And we didn't, we didn't know about it. It was an accident. And this happens all the time. So um, here, the, I'm, I'm going to just talk about one area of backfires and from stress. So I talked about cortisol. Now, with cortisol and stress induction techniques and pressure techniques, um, we actually have to use them. So stress, I believe stress must be in all of your motivating, but just at the right level. Um, people don't mind a little bit of stress as long as it's not unhealthy stress. So a little bit of stress. Um, if you have too little stress, people will be unmotivated. And if you have too much, you'll go into unhealthy levels of stress. And the thing with cortisol is it banks up. So everything that causes stress puts the person into a higher and higher stress state, which means you can accidentally push people over. So if you want to intentionally use some pressure tactics, but you have bad UI and, and all sorts of problems with your messaging, you might accidentally, with your pressure technique, push someone into distress in a way you wouldn't have if you had, you know, better UI and had managed all these other like little mini stressors. So, so stress techniques need to be balanced. We need a bit in there, but not too much, and you have to pull out all unintended stress and boosters. Otherwise, you can't employ those other ones. So, here's an example of a typical stress induction technique. Now, antivirus software. Uh, plays um, a little bit of good cough, bad cough over time. And if you ever download a 30-day trial of an antivirus software, you're going to have this um, design pattern um, used on you to get you to convert. And what it is is, over the next 30 days, they're going to—they got 30 days to upsell you, pretty much. And so initially, they're going to tell you about the benefits. And most of their messaging is positive. There's, of course, implicit threats. So, you know. Avoid, avoid getting hit with viruses, avoid getting attacked by hackers, avoid, you know, all the problems that antivirus software helps you with. Now, as you get closer, they have more threats coming up and fewer incentives, and it gets more about avoiding the dangerous situation. And after that 30 days, they pretty much just whack you with threats all the time. And then, yeah, this is what you get. This is the big stick coming out. So they just keep hitting you with threat, and threat, and threat, and threat. Now, there's a point where you can go too far. Made this sale, so I, you know, I, I guess it's fair game, right? They haven't, they haven't converted. So, what do they have to lose at this point? Um, but there's a point where you could potentially overdo it, and I'll just step back because there's a point where you have to have that right mix. Uh, where you're looking for the optimal blend between threats and opportunities. And overdo it and you're potentially in trouble. Now, let me talk about when things go really bad here. So if we go from high stress state and repeat stress that someone cannot solve leads to helplessness. And that's where you lose someone permanently. I, I mean, we don't know this entirely because um, this is an area of research that goes into unethical practices. Now, we know a lot from Pavlov, uh, the area of research where this comes from, where you have something called learned helplessness, was used to induce nervous breakdowns in people and brainwashing techniques. And it's really a dark uh, area of psychology. Um, and we also have clues to what's going on from antidepressants. 
um, and when people completely lose hope. Um, and other areas of more positive uh, psychology where we pull people out of helpless states, where we talk about self-efficacy, confidence building. But I believe when you put people into these states that the evidence suggests you cause permanent damage. And sorry, I, I have to swear again, but if you've ever been screwed by a company, uh, probably a, a more company that trapped you into an unethical con um, they tricked you, maybe the salesperson lied to you about what's going on, and then you get in, and then their, their staff say, oh no, or, or they make things more complex, and, then they, and, then, and now you're dealing with their legal department. Um, you, you know what it's like, and what happens is this causes, if this can cause permanent damage, like you will never trust that company again. So this is one of the, and we have to manage this and never ever, I think it's now uh, time for me to hand over yep. to you, Michael, okay. to now show a few more uh, practical applications of these projects. Yes, I will. I'll go through this pretty quickly because we're over time. Um, but yeah, I'll show you some different examples of uh, backfires related to cortisol and stress. So just real quick, uh, kind of so what, what Brian was talking about before. This is my kind of little bit simplified version here. If we have, you can kind of say the dopamine and cortisol in this context are like opposite drivers, right? So really dopamine, uh, dopamine here, when we're, when we're delivering a dopamine surge or a dopamine spike, well, then that's indication of a, of a nice experience, something that's good, good uh, for survival. And then we have cortisol over here. So once we spike cortisol, it's indicative of a bad experience or something that's not good for our survival. So we really wanna, you know, wanna keep the balance here it's a good way of thinking about it. So one of the things is uh, this stuff goes uh, way back to our, our forefathers. So um, for, I don't know, <laughs> Brian can correct me on the right numbers, but hundreds of thousands of years back. So when these things developed in our brains, we had some, some very, very serious threats in, in our environment where when cortisol was triggered, in most cases, it was a true life or death uh, uh, situation. Now, modern human beings, um, our brains haven't really developed enough to be able to be uh, super precise when it comes to whether it's it's actually something that's uh, an external life threatening situation or whether it's an internal alarm, because uh, cortisol is to help you avoid pain in the future. So when you experience pain, cortisol, the cortisol reaction, the feeling of oh god, I have to do something right now, is tied to that situation. So that means you you you'll you'll learn that experience for the for the next time as well. So. Today, we have difficulty distinguishing between real life threatening situations and an internal alarm. So watch that, once that internal alarm is sounded, we actually get the feeling of the impending doom, which helps explain why I'll speak in general terms. This is based on my experience from my own person and from doing a lot of usability tests. Is people can freak out and get extremely ridiculously frustrated and angry. I know I can. Going back to the example of trying to book tickets through Ryanair, I'm ready to throw my laptop out the window. And how I can get that desperate, cortisol helps us understand that. Well, some of the things that are typical backfires here, uh, uh, which trigger high cortisol reactions are, for example, stop words. So you have some learned behavior, for example, where then uh, a certain word can trigger uh, you know, a nervous reaction, a stress reaction. So for example, I've experimented quite a lot with using a spam in, in, the, in spam policies, basically. So obviously we have GDPR now, so I have to reconsider this, but I just want to show this as an example. But basically, um, I've done a lot of split tests on this, and every time I've, I've had the word spam in a spam policy, uh, it has it is hurt con form conversions, form submissions. So this is an example from the usability test I did where I showed this, and I asked, would you feel safe entering your personal information after reading the spam policy? And then you get, you get comments like this at a glance it looks like you're spamming me so no or i just see the we hate spam sentence no i probably wouldn't enter my information based on this and the reason why i've used this one is it's actually exactly what i've seen a lot on the internet and the interesting thing here is basically you're emphasizing the one word the stop word that people have a negative reaction to so really all you're doing here is, is writing spam so this is a typical backfire where you're trying to say we're not going to do this, but all you re but what you are triggering in a certain amount of, of people anyways is a reaction saying, oh my God, they're probably going to do that. So I, that's a very literal backfire. Stop words are very interesting and it's, it's uh, one of the things that can really help you is figure out within your industry what are the stop words. 
uh, dark patterns. Uh, obviously, Brian mentioned this quickly before, but you know, deliberate um, um, scammy behavior. You know, uh, where you're actually trying to deliberately dupe someone. So, for example, this one is a disguised ad, right? You think that um, you have to click one of those when actually the download uh, uh, button is over on the left under uh, Onyx for Mac, really. So you click that. And somewhere else that's a horrible feeling and that is very bad expectation management too because i'm thinking one thing's going to happen is something completely different that's going to happen um and then you remember that so uh, another thing you see a lot is for example in e-commerce people get you uh, have hidden costs again that's kind of a feeling of helplessness and it's also that feeling of being let down like hey you were dishonest with me. I didn't know this. I wouldn't have said yes if I had known this. Another thing is, for example, we see when we do usability tests and so on, uh, qualitative uh, research. For example, if you sneak something into the basket, that's another thing that get, people get really angry about. So dark patterns are dark for a reason. That's because they you know, make people basically hate you once you figure out. So as, as Brian said before, it can be effective for short term. Long term, it's going to be damaging to your brand and your relationship with your customers violating expectations so I talked about this earlier where it's really important to manage expectations because another thing is we um, it's good for our survival when our expectations are met it also makes logical sense it will feel as a threat to our survival when our expectations are met so we have a negative a cortisol reaction when when something doesn't come through the way we want it to come through this is an example from when I was working at Unbounce, and um, it's such a clear example. You might have seen me use it before, but it gets the point across very, very well. Uh, this was an old version of the uh, uh, checkout process where basically you, you, you went through um, a lot of marketing communication for Unbounce, where it's saying free trial, free trial, free trial, free trial. You go through the pricing page, free trial. You get to the first step in the checkout, and it says free trial, and, and there's only four pieces of information you have to fill out. Well, what happens is when you click the free trial, Ta-da! 13 surprise fields and we want your credit card information. That is a very, very, very different outcome than what we're saying. So in, in you know, the button was saying fr summer free trial, but really what happened is you need to give up your credit card information. So one of the ways we fixed this was to actually have a progress bar that showed you the steps. And then it actually said, uh, 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 continue your credit card information. You're going to get the free trial, but there's different reasons why Unbounce wants your credit card information up front. One is obviously it'll make it easier for Unbounce, but also it'll make it easier for you if you want to continue to save all your data after you've uh, gone through this uh, 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 trial. So that brings me back to just reiterate the point that every single step in the funnel primes the next. So we've been priming people to believe that it was a free trial and there's four form fields you have to fill out when actually there's something completely different. Violating expectations, you really, really have to be careful with. Uh, ambiguity is another thing that's very difficult for us. This also goes back to cognitive psychology. You'll see there's a lot of overlap. Uh, if you read uh, neuroscience uh, alone or cognitive alone, like Brian was saying before, it covers different areas. They might have different explanations, but once you start getting into both, you see there's a lot of overlap and you can, you can put these things together. So for example, in cognitive psychology, one of the things Brian talked about was the fact that it's limited how many things we can do at once. In the heat test, we also saw the multitask, it was really hard. So here's an example. I live in Vancouver. It's a very competitive housing market. A while ago, I had to find a new apartment. Uh, that's difficult in Vancouver. When you find something you want, you sprint there before the horde of other people who want the apartment. So I saw an apartment I wanted. I clicked the link, uh, book an apartment. Then it got super ambiguous from here because really, there's two forms on this page. Book an appointment. And then the other one says, or book an appointment today. And I'm like, what should I do? Well, I want the apartment. I should probably use the one that's book, book apartment today. But then I get really confused because then on the other form, it says, uh, I'm interested in seeing which apartment number I can choose. Quite a few I can choose between. Uh, I have no idea which one it was. Ah, panic ensues. Uh, what I do? Well, uh, okay. So there's all this uh, contact information up here, basically everything. That's the one form here where I have to choose the apartment. I don't know which one I'm interested in. The other one here talks about doing it today and I have to put in different information. And there's even a link that takes you off this site to another uh, real estate website. So basically I have four different options here. What should I do? Well, in this case, I was desperate. desperate so I, I filled out both forms. I went to the other website. I called them. I emailed them and I heard nothing back. 
which makes me think that maybe it's just because I forgot to actually fax them because they have a fax number there. So it's probably the right thing to do. But this is an extreme example of ambiguity, but it just makes you desperate because you're in a hurry. You're trying to get something done. Uh, you've primed me to believe that it's going to be easy. I just have to book an appointment. All of a sudden, I'm stuck there in my tracks because I don't know what to do here. So therefore, managing expectations is, is just really, really important. In cases like this, we want to make sure that uh, that every step is logical and that people uh, actually were driving them towards an actual goal and that they feel empowered and that they feel like they're in control of what's going on that they actually understand it. Okay, Brian, uh, back to you. Okay. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah, so um, we are now uh, just going to uh, wrap up. So back to me, but um, did you want to mention Yes, but uh, if you could just uh, share the screen again. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you? Oh, you can't see it. Okay, hold on. Or maybe. Sorry, maybe that's uh, me. Uh, sorry. Yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> I was confused. I was on the wrong one. All right. So wrapping up, we went over time. We apologize for that. There's just so much meat on the on on this topic. So and geeked out a little bit. We're we're very excited about this stuff. But we hope you uh, enjoyed watching this webinar. We hope you we whetted your appetite and we hope we gave you maybe a little bit different uh, perspective or uh, opened a little bit more on the, the, the black box as far as what it means to apply psychology and neuroscience to zero. Basically, in our approach, what, what, it, what it helps us do is basically it helps us do better optimization work. It helps us understand better what's going on in the minds of our customers. It gives us some concept that, that actually makes it much more, uh, gives us a more structured approach to how to persuade people online. And also how to do it in an ethical way and how to avoid backfires and how to avoid actually doing, inadvertently doing nasty things to the most important people to your business and those are your customers. So if you're interested in more of this, we're kicking off a course next week uh, on Tuesday. Uh, it's four weeks, it's eight lessons, and we're going to be doing, we're going to be digging deep into this stuff. Uh, we'll be repeating some of the things you saw in this webinar, obviously, but there's going to be so much new uh, stuff, and we're, uh, we're going to go through neuroscience, we're going to go through cognitive, we're going to give you a bunch of different processes and tools and, and toolkits and so on, all kinds of stuff that will make this a lot more yeah, um, easy for you to work with uh, in your own life. Uh, go check out the landing page on the CXL uh, Institute. Uh, all everything. Just go to uh, CXL Institute, and then under Live Courses, you'll see our Psychology course, and you'll be able to sign up for it. All the details are in there. Awesome. Well, we would like to say thank you very much for joining. On behalf of Brian, myself, and Douglas Squirrel, we really enjoyed this. Uh, I know we're over time, but let's look at uh, if we have some questions here, real quick. Yeah. Uh, just open them up, Brian. Okay. Or maybe actually people can't. Um, they can't see. Um, we can. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, fire away. And I'm also going to scan. Well. A bunch of comments, just many people saying uh, thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, Someone uh, shared a link. Um, yeah, don't record at 11 or make sure your judge has had a break. Yes. Uh, oh, someone asked. Uh, yeah, someone's saying Doug Douglas did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, uh, Douglas is, is a great, great stand in, a great uh, actor. He's, he's very believable. I think we went through the uh, the questions uh, from before. There's one question here from uh, Steve. I think he was saying uh, something about making a business case for neuroscience. He got the answer there, but then he says, so the person I need to convert is a pragmatist. So long as I get the result, I don't care why. With fractional factorial experiential design, experimental design, I can get there quickly. So what is the benefit? That's a pretty convoluted question there. Uh, I might pass that over to you, Brian. It was... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, where is this one? It was earlier in the, in the stream. It was from Steve at 9.09 .09 a.m. Okay, great. Okay. I think he was asking... Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, we're in the room, lots of tests.
Um, from, from my experience in um, trying to bring people on board for measurement, uh, it's not always a, a straightforward thing. And um, if you want to build a culture around measurement, um, one of the first problems is, is that um, you have to persuade your colleagues and especially your bosses in the upper management to be open-minded to applying uh, like data-driven uh, creative design and uh, marketing strategies. And so uh, you actually have to use a bit of behavioral science in your company or organization before you'll have any chance of hoping to apply it outside. And so I, I always took a bit more of like a, um, you know, a lighthearted approach to this. So one would be, you know, obviously, I, I've always been the numbers guy in most of the places I was working, but I would try and get people to ask questions and find out what they were interested in. And then as a researcher, what I would do is I'd say, well, here, let's see if I could give you some answers to your questions. And so I would bring people on board that way. Um, what has become more common nowadays is to try and sort of build up a culture. So if people are still like early stage, maybe brown bag lunches, um, like internal like team education. And then if you can get people to try out some conversion optimization tools or go and start doing like split testing and ad platforms, is you, you get people to come up with the hypothesis so that you're using research as a fun democratic process where no one feels like, oh, they didn't try out my ideas. Because um, the minute you start running tests that come from other people, they're going to be interested and, and, and be clear, hey, this is John's concept or, you know, Sally suggested we do that. We ran this split test and bring it back and don't come to people with a feta complete where you're like, okay, you know, the click through rate is this, therefore this is the scientific truth, but rather here's what we've learned and try and include people in the process. Um, I also, from my experience as a scientist is I know I can't just go and quote papers. Uh, someone who doesn't want to believe something will disregard um, overwhelming evidence and they'll come up with every excuse in the book. So I find more uh, like a cultural uh, building approach works well. Um, another thing, I haven't yet dug up the research on this, but we know conversion has been growing in the industry. So it, often you'll get um, people in your company to do something when they feel they're being left behind because everyone else is uh, doing it in the industry and quite often the laggards are actually in that case it's, it's not unfair manipulation it's just pointing out pretty much the obvious um, plain facts uh, so one thing is showing industry trends in the adoption of conversion and data-driven marketing uh, another thing more at a higher level is um, and i don't yet know the stats on this i'm just figuring out i'm seeing it through triangulation but i believe Fairly large corporations are all now hiring behavioral scientists and also setting up entire behavioral science teams uh, to bring uh, behavioral science insights across their whole organization, not just sort of marketing and digital. Advertising. So even just like showing um, those market trends, I think we'll do a lot more than the proof. And finally, if people don't see numbers in your like uh, conversion list and impact, uh, you definitely will not have them in the long term. Let me, uh, there's just a couple of questions here. I, I shared the, um, I shared the, the course landing page for the Institute, uh, in the chat there. Uh, the, this presentation, you will be able to, you'll, you'll get it afterwards. I, I believe you'll, you'll receive an email with the recording. So you'll be able to get it afterwards in the slide deck too. Uh, there was a question, uh, link, uh, or Lynn was saying, is there a link to a website to learn more about the four week course? Yeah, we just shared that. And she's saying, if we're not able to make that one starting on July 17th, do you have other courses? Uh, we have other courses coming up, but you will be able to do the CXL course. So, so it's, it's live and we'll be teaching it live for those four weeks, but it'll be a, uh, available uh, for self pace afterwards. So you can do it later, then it just won't be interactive. Uh, what is the time investment needed for the four-week course? Well, it's two hours a week, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, a little bit longer than that. So we're going to give you some homework too. Uh, we're not going to have too much time to be able to go through it and make sure that you did your homework. That's going to be on you. So it's, it's your own investment. You'll be doing between two to four hours a week, I'd say. Um, yes. And there was one more question. Uh, uh, so are we able for, uh, Steve is asking if we're able for, available for consulting 
Uh, yes, we are. Uh, <laughs> Shoot us a separate email for that. Uh, uh, yes. I believe, uh, yeah, I believe we're through. There was one thing uh, Utkash from oh. VWO was asking, how does behavioral economics overlap with neuroscience? We, Ryan, you answered that earlier, but could you give a quick, uh, just a real quick explanation for that one? Yeah, so they've just come from a uh, very different areas. Uh, um, many people describe the behavioral sciences one field or applying psychology to the web as if it's one field but when, when you're in there it's it's a big chaotic zoo of different fields uh, academic silos uh, made like politics uh you know groups cite one area of research and don't cite another and so behavioral economics um has like oh, there's a lot of overlap between concepts but they came from very different areas so behavioral uh, economics came from uh, researchers saying, well, the classic models of economics are based on rational decision making, where all humans make rational cost benefit analyses. And then from that, they would build up these uh, models of how economies work. And then the behavioral economists said, well, actually, you know what? These humans are pretty irrational. So <laughs> shouldn't we actually model economic models based on how people are in reality or in practice rather than how they are in theory? And that's why you have economists um, coming up with books like Freakonomics, right? Which are endlessly fascinating, but you're like, why, why are economists writing about like the crazy behavior of people in gangs and sumo wrestlers and unethical uh, business leaders stealing bagels? <laughs> which is the type of things they come in, and they're fascinating. And I think that's why behavioral economics became the thing. Um, and then neuroscience goes in the, the mechanisms. We talked about one where there's overlap and that's on the um, that, um, understanding about cognitive load. And so one of the behavioral economists use a lot of heuristic biases. So they say, it's not that people are rational, it's just that we have these cognitive rules that we use to interpret the world and they're flawed. And that flaw is explained a bit more by the neuroscience. And it goes into the factors in which we're going to use like a flawed heuristic rather than make a, an in-depth cost-benefit analysis to understand what's going on. Awesome. Thank you everyone very much uh, for joining us and uh, thank you for sticking around so long. There's quite a few of you left here. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, feel free to hit us up uh, on other platforms afterwards if you have any questions. And uh, yeah, hope to see some of you guys on the course starting next week. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye.